Well, good morning, Transplant Helper community. My name is Jim Merle, and I've been receiving a ton of questions concerning medical masks, if you should wear them, if so, what type, what kind, are they effective, are they not? And I know there's a lot of information out there that's kind of mixed on this, and it depends on who you go to as to what that opinion will be like. So what I'm going to be basing my opinion on today, and I said opinion, is basically just over all the information I've gathered from everybody and the research I've done, not just during the current situation, but way prior to this in trying to study and just understand what type of mask we ought to wear, particularly as a transplant patient. Now, with that being said, I'm going to be putting a chart up on the screen here in just a moment. That's just going to be kind of a guideline for us to go by. Someone sent this to me the other night, and by the way, thank you for that. Um, I do think this chart has a lot of truth to it. However, I do think in the end of it, some of the numbers are a little bit skewed. And I'll try to mention those as we go through and look at these types of masks. Now, I'm going to pop the chart up here right now, and we're going to be looking at the very first mask there on what is my top left. I don't know what it looked like to you. But anyway, the N95 mask. What is the N95 mask? Well, basically the N95 mask is the mask that everyone is recommending right now, especially if you're a medical professional. This is the mask that gets a great seal around the face. It has the wire in it. It's just fitted all the way around. And it's got enough filtration in it, actual filtration in it, to actually keep out the majority of colds, flus, viruses, that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, you'll see here on the chart, it says viruses are 95 Five percent bacteria is 100%, dust is 100%, and pollen is 100%. So you can go ahead and assume that's a pretty good mask. If you're able to actually get a hold of one of those N95 masks, that's a pretty good mask. But we need to disclaim in this that they're actually been asking us all the while to please, please, please reserve these N95 masks for those who are either in the medical field and or at high risk. Of course, you and I as transplant patients being immunosuppressed, yeah, we're at high risk. So if you've gotten your hands on one of these, then I'm thankful that you did. If you haven't, this is probably your ultimate goal if you can get to that, but uh, they're just not a lot available there for the general public. Most of these are being pointed toward uh, the medical uh, field, and, and I'm thankful for that. And if any of them fall back our way, that is good too. Now, the second mask here on the chart, I'll pop back up, is the general surgical mask. Now, this is not a N95 mask, mask necessarily. It's not intended to keep so much out as it is to keep something in. You can obviously understand if a surgeon goes in to do a surgery, they open you up, whatever body part it is, they're gonna wear a mask that again fits very well and has some level of filtration, but the main protection in that really doesn't come down uh, to protecting them from you as it does protecting you on the table from them. And so if they were to happen to cough or sneeze or get down close and breathe or whatever, that's where the majority of that protection comes in. And here on the chart, it claims that this one uh, takes care of 95% of viruses, 80% uh, of bacteria, 80% of dust, and 80% of pollen. Now, again, this is the surgical type mask, so it's not as fitted as the N95, as in it's not going to seal, but as far as coverage, it does pretty well. This one, generally speaking, either loops around the ears with elastic type loops, or maybe ties around the neck and head. You've all seen them if you had any type of surgery whatsoever. Now, the very next mask over here to the, on the chart is what's called the FFP one mask. Now, this one's a little bit different. This is kind of a hybrid, if you want to see it as that, between the N95 and the basic surgical mask there in the middle. This FFP1 uh, mask claims to take care of 95% of viruses, 80% of bacteria, 80% uh, of pollen, and 80% of dust. And I may have got those two reversed. But anyway, about 80 to 90% of basically everything. So this is a pretty good mask. Now, again, this has a similar characteristic more so to the N95 because, again, it is a fitted mask, it is a filtered mask, and it does have a pretty good seal if they're used properly. And we're going to say something about that here in just a moment. Now, to pop the chart up again here at the bottom, there are the active carbon masks. Now, these masks are not nearly as effective for protecting you from basically anything, okay? And we'll read the numbers here. You can already be reading those numbers, but they're not as much for protecting you as they are for taking care of, say, smells. A carbon filtered mask is really there for the smell. Now, some masks have both the bacterial type, viral type, uh, particulate layer. They also have a carbon layer, so they protect you from smells. And back when I first did the Vogue mask review, the original one, I kind of made a joke about that, that little bit of carbon protection that they and other masks sometimes have, 
uh, in that I could uh, basically hold a dirty diaper. And I've got a lot of little ones, so I could hold a dirty diaper in my hand and not smell it as much. So these masks are good uh, for a lot of different things. Obviously, if you work around chemicals and stuff, that might help with some of the smells. If you work in the food industry, same idea applies. These are generally pretty good masks, but when it comes to the real numbers, which I'll show you here again, when it comes to viruses, only a 10% amount of help here. When it comes to bacteria, 50%. When it comes to dust, 50%. When it comes to pollen, 50%. So especially given our current situation, these have some of the least effectiveness and protecting you from the viruses themselves. So I don't really recommend the active carbon mask. You probably want to steer clear of those. They're just not appropriate for the time, although they do have their use case situations. Now you'll notice here on the chart, the next type of mask that is listed at least is the general cloth mask. Now, the thing about the cloth mask, this is probably becoming the most popular of all masks that you're gonna find right now. That comes due to the shortages of the N95s, the surgical masks, the FFN, P1s, whatever that was, and the, and these uh, carbon masks. All these masks are in short supply. And so because of that, a lot of wonderful, wonderful people have volunteered to make their own mask. Maybe they've got some sort of a talent when it comes to sewing, to, to stitching or whatever, whatever you call that. But uh, they're actually taking cloth, going out and purchasing cloth or, or reusing, you know, old clothing that's not... Uh, not useful anymore. They're taking that, cutting that up into a very certain pattern. They're making cloth masks. And again, if you remember the, the Vogue mask is a cloth mask, although it has a filtration layer to it. It has a valve, sometimes one of those or two of those one-way valves. All those things are bonuses and plus that make them higher quality. But a lot of people are making the cloth mask and they may be made out of a bandana, out of an old t-shirt, uh, uh, some cloth bought at the store, whatever. But there are a lot of people who are out of a good heart voluntarily making these hand-sewn, beautiful, wonderful masks and they're sharing them free for all. They're giving them over to the to the hospital staffs, to the medical staffs, they're giving them to their family, to their friends, to, to people who they know is at high risk. That's a wonderful thing, okay? That is absolutely wonderful. But I'm gonna pop the chart up here and I want you to look at it carefully. I want you to understand that these masks are not that effective in, in the main area we need them in. For example, according to this chart at least, the cloth mask, when it comes to protecting from viruses, has a 0% chance of doing that. When it comes to bacteria, we're looking at about 50%. When it comes to dust, about 50%. And pollen, also about 50%. So again, the current situation with this virus that's going around, the most of what you need right now is protection from the viruses. And it said here, the cloth masks do not do that. Now, as a disclaimer, let me tell you, I said in the onset, there were probably some, some flaws, some issues, some problems with this chart. And I think this happens to be one of them. I think the cloth masks have, are more effective uh, then this chart is portraying, okay? I don't think that they are 0% effective in this case. I do think, however, that number's rather low. I do think that number of the cloth mask is very similar to what you might say for the active carbon mask or maybe, you know, something else of similar nature to it because it just doesn't have the filtration in it. I get it. I can take my t-shirt right now and I can pull it up and I can put it on my face, and, and I feel as if there's some filtration, especially when it comes to dust and pollen, and which it claims it has some effectiveness against that, dust and pollen, and maybe bacteria, because bacteria are larger than viruses. There's some protection there, but the virus itself, there's very little, if any, protection admitted here on the chart, and I think that's fairly accurate. Now, is that to say that I don't want these wonderful people producing these masks, sharing these masks, helping people out? No. I definitely like that. I love to see it. I think it does a lot of good. Now, although there's not the filtration in there that we really need as far as protecting us, there is one main thing that every mask has in common, no matter how high quality or low it may be, and that is it prevents us from touching our face as much. If nothing else, it is a reminder not to touch our face, to touch our nose, to touch our mouth. In, in this case, to touch our eyes, because that's the areas in which the main areas, mouth, nose, and eyes, in which these viruses are being transferred in. So anything we can do that keeps or prevents that, or at least lessens that, I think it's good to do it. And so if the cloth mask is a way of achieving that, I think it's wonderful. And I think it will help people, especially the general public, especially those of us who are at a little bit lower risk 
than say someone working in a hospital, someone 65 or older, or someone who's immunosuppressed. The general public, I think, would definitely benefit from this. If for no other reason, it is a reminder and something, that, a barrier to them touching their face. But when you use that mask or any other reusable mask, and these cloth masks are, are, masks are reusable, one of the things you have to remember is, number one, they have to be sanitized. You can't go out in town, wear this mask, feel protected, uh, yeah, it keeps you from touching your face there, and then walk in the house. As soon as you get home, pop the mask off, throw it on the kitchen counter, and then start scratching your face. Does no good because your, your hands have now been contaminated. The best practice that I've seen, if you're going to wear a, a reusable mask, is probably going to be to... For that scenario, go to the grocery store, don't touch your face, avoid touching your eyes because the mask is not necessarily covering that. Then when you come in, walk in the house, wash your hands thoroughly. Get the groceries out, whatever, get those things out. Wash your hands extremely thoroughly, at least 20 seconds under running water with soap. And after doing that, kind of shake dry your hands or use a paper towel. Don't use the dirty dish rag like we like to do, <laughs> hanging it over the stove handle. But, you know, take that, wash your hands thoroughly, and then pop the mask off, set it aside and let it sit. And and it can basically sanitize itself in, in a number of hours just because it sat there. Better yet, you can wash this off in some warm soapy water to try to clear it up or throw it in the washing machine. That's a good idea as well. And I think that will help you out a lot. Now, now for the very ma last mask here on the chart, I'll pop it up. It's the sponge mask. Honestly, I've never in my life heard of the sponge mask. So I would probably avoid that one altogether if you can even find such. It has zero uh, effectiveness against anything. So don't even worry about the sponge mask. It's not going to work. Okay. So let's go back through the list here. I'll throw it on the, the screen one more time. You can kind of examine it for yourself. Got the N95 surgical mask, or the, the N95 mask, the surgical mask, the FFP1 mask. That's hard for me to say. The active carbon mask, the cloth mask, I would call the homemade or handmade mask, and then the sponge mask. Now, those are your choices, and I think the higher up on the tier you can go for the N95 or each step down, the probably the better off you are. Do I recommend the Vogue mask? Surely I do, but the thing is, those things are not as available right now, and unless any of these masks are used properly, and I mean by that they're worn and then taken off of, hands are washed, face washed, whatever, and then they are sanitized each day, they're of no use. So you're probably just as well off with a good-fitting disposable mask, something like the uh, either the, the top three here as anything just because it's disposable. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, stay stronger, friends.